25 years as pastor of one of the largest churches in Flatbush, Brooklyn. We'll hear from that church leader, Bishop Michael Mitchell. Darrell Person will be chatting with Sharon Rose and Shari Logan about his trip to Haiti. Did you know that dark chocolate, as bitter as it may be to you, is actually better for your health than milk chocolate? Stay with us, and Yolanda Watson will be joining you later to talk about the power of a smile. Talking about a smile, Daryl Person has just returned from his first trip to Haiti. Haiti! And yes, he has a smile on his face. Daryl, tell me about the international trip that your organization took um, to Haiti. Well, <clears throat> 500 Men has been an organization that has been doing work in the uh, community of Bed-Stuy for about four years. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was very happy to lead the first international trip, which we did to Haiti. And uh, we were able to fundraise to take um, two mentees and two mentors, including myself, mm -hmm. uh, for a total of five of us down to Haiti for a week to uh, rebuild homes and rebuild permanent housing mm -hmm. for individuals who were living in a tent city. Uh -huh. So um, that was that was a great time that we had down there. And um, all of us had a had a tremendous experience with uh, uh, going through that that week and, and sharing our experiences with the uh, locals there. So you said that you went down there to build homes. What exactly did you do once you got there? Well, once we got there, uh, the trip was from Saturday to Saturday. Mm -hmm. So the first Saturday that we got there, we settled in. Mm -hmm. uh, the Sunday, we went to church. We went to one of the local churches and uh, prayed and uh, basically um, shared service with, with some of the uh, uh, people from Haiti. Mm -hmm. And then um, on Monday is when we commenced to work. Okay. So we went to the site. Uh, there were about six different homes that we worked on in mm -hmm. different phases of development. Mm -hmm. So some of it was um, foundation work, uh, making sure that uh, we mixed concrete for the, the different walls and the uh, cinder block walls that they put up. Mm -hmm. uh, other projects that we worked on while we were down there was uh, putting together the truss system, which basically forms the roof support. Okay. So we fabricated those those members and also installed them on top of the roof and uh, also installed the uh, uh, aluminum roofing. Uh, we also painted some of the housing and uh, we also had the privilege of hosting empowerment workshops with the villagers. So we had four different sessions that we conducted throughout that week to basically leave some type of encouragement for them for when we left. Okay, Daryl, you mentioned um, Tent City. I want to ask you about that <coughs> later on. And I want to talk some more about the empowerment workshops. But first I want to ask you, um, what prompted you guys to decide to, to focus on Haiti as a target for this um, mentoring experience, this experience? Okay, well, my mm -hmm. first experience with, uh, I should say my second experience with Haiti was going down there with Emmanuel Baptist Church who had a 10-year commitment with uh, rebuilding uh, uh, homes for some of the displaced individuals down in Haiti. And I went down there with them and um, had a great experience during that trip. So one of the things I wanted to do when I came back mm -hmm. was to make sure that I was able to transfer that experience to others who okay. may not have had that opportunity. So uh, I spoke to my leadership over at uh, 500 Men and I had this vision of taking more guys with me down there. So we put together a strategy where we did some fundraising and we were able to take uh, four other guys outside of myself down there. Great initiative you take you took. Now tell me about the tents. Um, what is a tent city and um, how does that um, affect the members? Like how was it identified and what happens in a tent city? Well after the earthquake in mm -hmm. 2010, uh, any land that was available for families to gather and put up some type of makeshift shelter, mm -hmm. uh, which was mostly by tents, uh, different pieces of um, materials that they can find laying around as well as uh, uh, 
pre-made tents that mm -hmm. different organizations such as you know the Red Cross and uh, other uh, service organizations come down there to uh, help out with providing some temporary shelter. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and then th and they just live in tents and right. So okay, there were wow. different villages that uh, became tent cities because they were just fields of land that everyone congregated and just set up just set up makeshift shop. houses. Right. Okay. Now tell us about some of the workshops, the empowerment workshops that were done on behalf of the um, the, the people in these tents. Uh, so mm -hmm. one of the things that we wanted to do was to make sure that we left some type of encouragement down there with the individuals in that in the village of Lombi. That was the village that okay. we... I've heard of it. <laughs> yeah, that was the village that we um, had this project going on with. Mm -hmm. And uh, I will, I'll talk specifically about uh, my workshop since I actually okay. attended it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we started out with... Uh, providing them some stress relief. So we had uh, the young ladies that was part of my team uh, came up with some yoga exercises that uh, the individuals can, can uh, uh, practice just to have some type of stress release. Mm -hmm. And then what we did was we broke up into two groups. So the women took the women of the village that showed up to, uh, to this workshop mm -hmm. and we took the men and we spoke about family planning. Hmm. And um, it was it was an amazing experience, and uh, the direction that we chose to take with that was to really find out where they were at mentally uh, within their community because they they kept asking us about what's five hundred men? What do you guys do? So okay. I took I took that as an expert uh, as an opportunity to expound on that. Sh sh um, you just share with us is what is the the one thing that you took away from this experience that will stay with you for. Along for the rest of your life? I would say the most monumental thing that mm -hmm. came out of that experience mm -hmm. was not to prejudge people mm -hmm. and to really, you know, if you go to a country where uh, they may not have the same liberties as us, not to judge them and think that they're uh, less intelligent or less privileged than we are, but to really understand where they're coming from and that they, they actually have the same uh, amount of love and, and community and um, love for family that, yes. that we have. And I, I think that was very, uh, very impactful from being down there in that experience. Okay, thank you. It sounds like a wonderful and enlightening experience. And we thank you for sharing that with us on Brooklyn 45. Thank you for thank having you, me. Thank you, Daryl. You may know by now that eating dark chocolate versus milk chocolate is better for you. According to experts, the flavonal nutrients which are present in dark chocolate can lower blood pressure and prevent heart attacks. The makers of M&M's and Snickers bar, along with the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, are conducting a study of the benefits of chocolate. The 18,000 persons who participate will either receive a dummy pill or two capsules a day of cocoa flavonols for four years without knowing which one they are taking. The flavonol capsules will be coated and will have no taste. After this study, their overall health will be measured against when they first started. If you want to know more, send an email to info at brooklyn45.com or post your question on our Brooklyn 45 Facebook page. Go to Facebook, then type Brooklyn 45 TV. 25 years. That's how long Bishop Michael Mitchell has been pastor of New Life Tabernacle at Utica Avenue and Avenue D in Brooklyn. The measure of success is not measured by how long you've been at something, but rather what you have achieved in that space of time. Bishop Mitchell, welcome to Brooklyn 45. Thank you. I'm honored what, to be here. What has this 45 years meant to you? Wow. It's been quite a journey, if to say the least. Uh, being pastor, being a minister of the gospel, a preacher of righteousness, it has really been a journey, and I have thoroughly enjoyed being used by God to spread His Word and to offer assistance to people that ask for it. We'll talk about that assistance later, but 25 years ago, take us back to that point. What were you? Where were you? I know you weren't at this magnificent edifice that you have now. 25 years ago, I was a music director for a church called New Life Apostolic in Ozone Park, Queens. Um, myself and Sister Mitchell were assisting there. Pastor Scotty Teets, 
when this small assembly group of people, New Life Tabernacle, was without a pastor for two years. My pastor asked me if I'd go over and preach that Sunday for them. And we went and preached Sunday morning, went back and preached Sunday night, and then our lives changed. My pastor called me Monday morning and said, Mike, they like you. And my response was, I like them too. Hmm. He said, they would like for you to become their pastor. Wow. I said, of what? <laughs> he said, How many people were there? 25 persons. Wow. And 12 of those were children. So I didn't have much to work with, but I now realize that the scripture is true. Little is much if God is in it. And I can say that God was in that decision. Did you have any idea that 25 years later you would have been pastoring a church of, what is it, 1,500, 2,000 people? Had not a clue. I knew that God wanted to use us. I knew that God was bigger than any circumstances or challenges that would come to us in building a church. I didn't know the magnitude of the blessing but I knew that if I started the journey, that it would take me somewhere. You said magnitude. Uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about the, this is business now. <laughs> let's talk about the magnitude of the building that you were able to construct. I mean, mm -hmm. that, that must have been a challenge. That was a challenge. When you look at it now, what you see today is not we, what we had envisioned to build at the beginning. On the onset of this project, we were only challenging ourselves to build a building to seat 500 people and it would have cost us no more than around a million two. It wouldn't have occupied all the space that it was occupying now. Uh, but as the journey progressed, then the vision became clearer and then the provision fell in place. I like that. Vision and the provision for the vision. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the absolute truth. Yes. We started this project with no money. The only, reason, the only reason why we were able to build this building, it's because we found favor with a banker. And she happened to be the branch manager of what was called NatWest. And one day I, I walked into that branch and said, you know, I've been doing business here and I would like to see how we can establish some line of credit with you. She said, where is your account? I said, well, it's in Long Island. That's where I live. She said, why don't you move your account to Brooklyn? And I'll see what I can do to you. So we moved our account to Brooklyn. And thus the journey began. Your angel was with you. And my angel was with me all the way through the process. You know, you haven't forgotten your roots. If you visit your church, you're not only the preacher. Mm -hmm. You not only deliver the word, but you also deliver, I should say, you not only deliver the spoken word, you also deliver the word in song. Mm. And uh, it's, it's amazing. T t tell us a little about your, your work and experience as music director and why you s continue to burst out in song as often as you do. Well, long before I was a preacher, I was a singer, songwriter. Mm. I started this journey when I was 13 years old in the only United Pentecostal Church in New York City, and that was in Manhattan, 296 West 92nd Street. And from that church, I had several instructors, mainly my Sunday school teachers. One bought me a bass guitar. Huh. The other one bought me a drum set. And from there, God just did the rest. And I kept playing instruments and playing instruments. Then I became the music director for the church. Then I became the youth president for the church. Then I formed my own singing group. And so from there, I became the choir director. And so I became the songwriter. And so I am pleased that my journey from music has transitioned me into being pastor. So as pastor, I have not forgotten mm -hmm. that I was first a singer. Yes. And I will always keep singing. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. 
you, you don't look that old <clears throat> yourself. I mean, you still look youthful. You still look like the, the youth that uh, the young people look up to you, I'm sure. Mm. And, and they ask you very often, how old are you? Yeah. <laughs> I am getting to the place now where I am shying away mm -hmm. from telling the number. Okay. But uh, we were playing a tape in church. I think you were there because we're getting ready to celebrate our 25 years of pastoral ministry. And so they were interviewing individuals that were there with us and those that are there with us now as to Pastor Mitchell and his journey. And so one sister who was there with me for 25 years, Sister Pequot by name, she said, when we got our pastor, God sent us a young bishop and a good-looking bishop. Who could last a long <laughs> time. <laughs> I guess she knew if I was young, I would uh -huh. last long. Sure. Yes. So God, in his own wisdom, kept me youthful. But he also gave me wisdom to manage the crisis, the problems, the issues, without them becoming a part of my DNA. And I think that's the secret to pastoring, is asking for God's wisdom. That's the one thing that Solomon sought after, you know, not riches. Mm -hmm. He said, Lord, just give me wisdom, knowledge, and understanding as to how to lead these people. Mm. And every man and woman of God that feels the call of God and will pursue it must ask God at the beginning of the journey, please give me wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Not wealth. Mm not prestige, mm -hmm. not an image, but just his mind as to how to handle the people that he has lent you to serve. And you feed these people. And we try to feed them. In I, fact, you not only feed them with the <coughs> word, you feed them, if you look across from where your church is, there's mm -hmm. this ice cream parlor where when I was allowed to eat ice cream, I would go and have my rum and raisin, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'd have my strawberry ice cream. Mm -hmm. I can no longer do that. But you're now feeding people with food and ice cream. Well, how, how, how do you do that? You know, there are, there are several churches mm -hmm. uh, who have their businesses mm -hmm. alongside the, the business of the church. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little about that. Well, the journey of building a church introduced me to my roots as far as in entrepreneurship. Um, I started this journey when I was 19 working for E.F. Hutton on Wall Street. And that introduced me as to how to manage money and how to use other people's money to build an empire. So when the opportunity to purchase the only Caribbean-based company that made Caribbean ice cream called Taste the Tropics was presented to us, we looked at it as an opportunity not only for entrepreneurship, but also as an opportunity to further take root in the community because that business gave us insight into the mindset of East Flatbush and the West Indian community that lived there and what flavors of interest, what interests them. So we were able to tap into another group of people that wouldn't have been turned on to the church, mm. but were turned on to the flavor Good. of ice cream. <laughs> yes. And the flavor of ice cream gave me the opportunity to present them to the taste of God. Okay. And like the Bible said, oh, taste and see. Yes. So once they taste great nut and then they tasted Jesus, <laughs> they decided I'll keep great nut, but I'll also I keep Jesus. Keep Jesus. Yes. And that's a beautiful decision. Oh, okay. <laughs> I want to talk about young people, but before we do that, what's happening for this 25th year? Well, uh, there's a group of people um, that's been chosen or selected to be to chair this committee that would put together a fit-in celebration as to our 25 years of pastoring. And so they are going to be putting together a service on Thursday night, April 24th, 25th, and then a banquet on the 26th at um, Grand Prospect Hall, which we are anticipating, or they're anticipating, over 350 persons to be there, along with several elected officials that will do citations and proclamations, and then a wonderful service on Sunday morning that we're anticipating a wonderful gathering of people. Well, um I wish you success in your 25 years. What's, what's going to happen the next 25? Because I know you're thinking about that already. 
You know, I have mixed emotions for the next 25. There, there are days I'd like to pass the baton to someone else. You're young. Ah, I, I know, and I'd like to stay that way. <laughs> okay. You know, the greatest challenge for a pastor is knowing when it's time to yes. pass. Yeah. Most ministers tend to want to die in this position. God never elected his servants to allow the work to become a burden. And a man of God has to know when it's the will of God to come and when it's the will of God to leave. So the challenge of the next 25 years is not what, what, what will I do? It's how will I do it and how much time will God allow me to do it? Because I do know that within the next 25 years, a young man is going to come after me. Mm -hmm. And hopefully it's one that I've groomed. And he will take the baton and take this church to heights that I only imagine it could reach. Young Bishop Michael Mitchell, who is the a pastor at New Life Tabernacle on the corner of Avenue D and uh, Utica Avenue. Thank you for being on Brooklyn 45. And uh, I know you're looking forward to 25 is young, so mm. 50 will still be young. But as you think youth and uh, so on, I'm sure that the young people will continue to look up to you and uh, you'll continue to guide them with wisdom. Yes. And, and help them to achieve their vision. Well, I hope to do that <laughs> <laughs> with much ease in the next 25 years. Sure. Yes. And as we talk about youth and young people, Sharon Rose is in the company of a young man who is a very, very interesting young person. Sharon? Thank you, Sam. Now, let's meet today's young academic achiever, Jordan Pierre. He's a seventh grader at Eagle Academy in Brownsville, Ocean Hill. Yeah. Welcome, Jordan, to Brooklyn 45. Thank you for having me here. Okay, now, oh. as I said, it's an accomplishment to be um, a young, chosen as a young academic achiever with Brooklyn 45. You have to have like tremendous accomplishments. I understand that you have a 97.5 average. Like, how can a young man of your age have such an accomplishment? Well, I believe there's three things that actually has a huge impact on my academic focus. And the three things I believe that have an impact on me is my is the competition within my setting, my desire to want to have a wealthy future, and the influential factors within my family. Okay, wealthy future, competitive setting. Yes. And um, influential factors. Okay, let's talk about influential factors. What are those factors, and how do they motivate you? All right. So the influential factors in which I'm regarding to are my parents, and they always push me to work harder and to always reach for the top. They never settle for what is not my best. They always make me work harder. Okay, so would you say it's your parents working or are you working? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, I'm doing the work, but they helping me. They push you along, eh? Yes. Okay, what are some of the things that um, you do that help you to keep your, that, those high standards? So some things that I do is that I study. Mm -hmm. I like to study for my exams, and even if I don't have an exam, I like to study so that I can maintain, so that I can know what, what the work is about. I like to study. And another thing that I'll do is mostly I'll go over my work and I always try to perfect perfect everything that I do. Perfection, okay, it's driving for per perfection. All right, what are some of the fav your favorite subjects? Like, what do you excel in? So I excel in all my subjects. Okay, I can see, 97.5. <laughs> <laughs> what, what are some of your favorites, my special favorites? favorites? Mm -hmm. is science, I love science and math. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I love science because in the future, I want to find a cure for cancer as well. Mm -hmm. So I love science and I love math because I love money. Okay, money. Tell, tell us about um, your love for um, wealth. Uh, how do you see yourself in the future, like yeah, when you're fully grown and well, fully educated? So when I'm fully educated in the future, I see myself as being someone that has an impact on the world, mm -hmm. that has like a huge voice on what happens. So I would like to be a judge in the future. A judge. Yes. Okay, why? I would like to be a judge to make some differences in certain laws and have a voice on what I think should be right. Okay. What are some of the things that you think are important for um, young people in your generation to know and to practice? So one thing I would like to tell, well, for young kids, I would like them to know that the more education you have, 
the better career you can have, and the better career you have, the more money you can make. Okay, okay. So do you actually personally, as an individual, think it's, it's mostly about money, or what are some of the no. other things you strive for? I really think that you should strive to have an education, because mm -hmm. in this new society, education is the key to success. Okay. All right, and what do you do for leisure when you're not counting money <laughs> and perfecting yourself? <laughs> So usually I like to write poems because I, I think I'm good with literature and uh -huh. I have a strong use of words. So I like to write poems. It helps me to express myself. Okay. What type of poems, poems are your favorite? So I usually write regular poems and it usually from like my heart. I usually use some of my surroundings. I usually write about the world mm -hmm. and my surroundings. It helps me to understand certain things and how they're going on. Okay, that's nice. That's very nice. It helps to connect you to your soul, yes. actually, poetry. Um, and in terms of like extracurricular activities, do you pr play any sports or do anything outside of your school and, you know, artistic um, pursuits? Well, actually, I consider myself as a Rhodes Scholar, so I'm, I participate in basketball, yeah. and basketball is one of my hobbies, and I love to play basketball. I believe I'm good in it, and I like basketball because it helps me to see other kids around the world and to be able to compete with them mm -hmm. on a higher level. And in my school, we're taught to stay globally conscious and globally competitive. Okay, so you're equally good a basketball player as you are um, in academics, right? So yes. if you had a choice like to focus on one or the other, uh, I know it's not time for that for you to consider that yet, but would you have a dilemma in, in deciding which, which road to take? No, well actually I set my priorities already to put oh. books before everything, so school come first. Excellent, excellent. Okay, what are some of the, um, the, the um, tips you have for young people and for parents who might be raising other teens like you? I would like for well, I would like to tell some parents to always believe in their child that they could do something because sometimes you don't always see the potential your child has the first time around, but mm -hmm. when you start to actually communicate with them and see how they're doing and push them to do better, you will see something come out of them. Okay, and what words do you have for your for, for, um, your your peers? So for my peers, I would like to tell them that education is important and to always maintain focus, because focus is the key. Okay, focus is the key. Now you heard it, folks. This is from Jordan Pierre, Young Academic Achiever for this week on Brooklyn 45. And um, look out for great things from this young man. Thank you very much. And now over to Yolanda.